This is CBC Here and Now. So I talked to her, I was talking to her about her baby. Yeah, and her we baby. We were talking about how we were going to meet up so I could meet her and stuff. The vehicle did not stop for the police officer and seconds later collided with an SUV. Can't do it. A 19-year-old mother being remembered tonight. While the RNC's actions are under review after this fatal crash Friday night in St. John's. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Alyssa Power was a passenger in the car with three friends, the 17-year-old girl driving and two teen boys. It was a horrific scene Friday night at the intersection of Hamlin Road and Canada Drive in the West End. Police say an officer tried to pull over the teenage driver of this Honda Accord. But the driver didn't stop and crashed into an SUV. Police aren't offering any more details, such as why the officer tried to stop the driver or if speed was a factor. As in all cases where an RNC officer is present at an incident that results in serious injury or death, I have requested that the, Depart the Department of Justice and Public Safety engage Nova Scotia's serious incident response to conduct an independent investigation. Those independent investigators are now in the city. And as they investigate, people are honoring Alyssa. Her friends are selling t-shirts to raise money for her one month old baby. Kind of, um, I'm honestly in uh, like shock. Yeah, same. Like, I don't know. Just don't want to believe it. I just it. didn't want to believe it, like. Still don't? Yeah. Um, she was uh, very outgoing and like, always make you smile like we were always doing something mm -hmm. there was a, always a crowd of we us we were always walking around like she was really like a fun person to be around like she always brightened up your mood like i don't know she always had a big heart and like for everybody like she has a lot of friends mm -hmm. like everyone knew Alyssa. like everyone everybody. hung out with her at one point like and she's really nice and like she was a really sweet girl and what about her um little girl alexis yeah i feel bad like she, uh, she looks just like her. Mm -hmm. It's sad. It's very sad. Mm -hmm. But uh, she has a lot of family. I know yeah. they will care for her. And they'll provide for her and mm -hmm. take care of her and make sure that like she got what she needs. She always wanted a baby. She's like, I always want to have a baby. And when she had a baby, I knew that... She was so happy. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I knew that something would make her like, life a lot better and stuff. Yeah. Um, well, when I found out, um, my mom came to me um, with this idea of making these t-shirts for her. So um, I kind of got together her a part of her favorite song and I put it there on the back in a picture of her mother and her and her baby. And her favorite color was uh, blue too. So I cleaned with that. So we're also going to sell those for $12 each and donate them, donate the money to the family and um, Alexis too. How will you remember Alyssa? I was like a fun, outgoing person. Like she was always on the go. Like she was always happy. Like I don't know. always make you smile. Mm -hmm. The driver and one of the two teenage boys in that car are still in hospital. In other news, the courts in this province may soon have another tool to help victims of the sex crime known as revenge porn. Those who share explicit images or video of someone without their consent could feel it in their pocketbook. That's because the provincial government will introduce new legislation allowing victims to take civil action. Though the legislation isn't just about revenge, it's about anyone who's sharing nude photos without consent. Here now is Terry Roberts is following this story today. Joining us now, Terry, sharing intimate images seems to have become common. Uh, yes, Debbie, that's for sure, because we all know that it's never been so easy to take a picture or a photograph and share it widely online. But what's happening here is that many people, mostly women, are having their lives ruined by this phenomenon. Essentially what happens in some cases is that former partners use these images to either blackmail or simply punish someone. Well, the provincial government is hoping that this new legislation will make people think twice about that. Ask any high school student about sharing nude photos and you'll hear things like this. I would definitely say revenge porn is very common in today's society, especially among high schoolers, due to uh, relationships breaking off and 
for, for veg, basically. If they get out there, like it can like totally mess up their social circles. It is a devastating topic and it does change people's lives. Ottawa made it a criminal offense three years ago to share intimate images without a person's consent. But wrongdoing must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's often a tall order. So the Liberal government is following the lead of four other provinces and developing legislation that will allow victims to sue their tormentors for financial compensation, where the burden of proof is not quite so onerous. It's horrible. It's not just humiliating. It's not just embarrassing. It's devastating. You know, People have chosen to take their lives because of the repercussions of this. Those in the legal community who represent victims of sexual crime are encouraged by the proposed legislation. And I think this is another way in which people are wielding power over their victims. And so I think it's a really positive step forward that victims are going to be given a voice through this new legislation. The term revenge porn is relatively new. Typically it happens when an intimate image is shared with a partner or friend and is then shared more widely on the internet. The consequences can be far reaching. And it can have long-reaching consequences uh, on their psychological health, on future employment, on relationships with their family, and many other assets, facets of their life. The 2013 suicide of Nova Scotia teen Retea Parsons after she was harassed and bullied online shocked the country and inspired lawmakers to take action. People need to realize that whether it's malicious intent or just not realizing what you're doing, it's not acceptable. Carson says he wants to develop the strongest possible legislation within the confines of the Constitution. And I'd love to see for a protection where you can have your device seized for sharing an image like this. What good reason does anybody have to do this? There's none. It's something that's only going to get worse if we don't take measures to stop it. Now this new legislation, well it's now being drafted by the Department of Justice and Public Safety and it could be brought before the House of Assembly and right now in this sitting of the House of Assembly or in the fall. So Terry, what are advocacy groups saying about this? Well, generally, uh, they're very pleased about this. I spoke today with Linda Ross. She's with the uh, Provincial Advisory Committee on the Status of Women. And she says the criminal court system, well, she said that has been less than satisfactory right now for victims of uh, sexual crime. And she believes this new legislation will give victims another option in their fight for justice. But she stresses there's also a heavy educational element right here. She says people need to realize that they just cannot share intimate personal images like this without the expressed consent of the person, of the subject of those photos and videos. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts in St. John's. If you're anything like me, you spend a lot of time looking at your smartphone each day. Maybe you're doing it right now. The provincial government says more skills on things like these are necessary inside our province's schools. I'll tell you more about that coming up on Here and Now. The cost of making marijuana legal is going to eat up most of the money that the province will make actually selling it. That's according to Finance Minister Tom Osborne. Numbers from the NL Liquor Corporation project pot revenues of almost $6 million this year, but the province will spend an estimated $4 million implementing marijuana legalization. That's on top of about $2.5 million the federal government is giving the province to help make weed legal. Striking workers at the Iron Ore Company of Canada in Labrador City are contemplating whether or not to go back to work. Weekend negotiations between their union and the company did result in an offer for the workers and soon they will be voting on it. Here now's Jacob Barker is in Lab City and spoke with workers on the picket line about how they uh, might vote. Jacob, what are you hearing? Well, Debbie, the union's executive is recommending that voters vote for tomorrow, uh, for the offer tomorrow, but there are mixed feelings on the picket line and no real sense of how tomorrow's vote might go. Three weeks in and workers here want their time on the line to mean something. One of the main sticking points was addressed in the latest offer from the company, the temporary workforce. Town couldn't survive having a temporary workforce. So what we have now is we have a permanent workforce that goes in, hired on a normal basis. So that's good for us. It's good for uh, it's good for the community. What happens next, though, is what kind of benefits 
were tossed in there. And while there was some small increases, there wasn't a whole lot of increase. Well, it was quiet and contemplative at the main gate. Reject! 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 Elsewhere, the tone was different. Workers at the rail yard were not at all happy with the offer being put forth. Our union took us on strike several weeks ago, gung-ho, and we're going back for less than what I believe what they offered us in the first place. And it's, it's not right. We have a lot of young people here who don't even know the difference of what the contract is. And we have a lot of senior people who are just getting shafted as they did all their lives. Not enough for these workers. Other issues around medical benefits and pensions still remain. I think our company and union should get back together and give us something that really makes sense. Okay. And to our union, I'm disgusted with you guys. I really am. But there are over a thousand workers that will make that decision and a lot of ways the vote could go. I'm talking to people. There's some people who are in favor, some people are not in favor. I think it's going to be each person has to go home, talk to their, uh, talk to their spouses, uh, talk to their family members and make a decision that's right for them. Well, workers will have their chance to have their say on whether they accept that offer. Tomorrow, the, U the vote takes place at the Union Hall between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Reporting live for Here and Now in Labrador City, I'm Jacob Barker. True pioneer of the mining industry, a great entrepreneur, and a humble man. A week after his death, the House of Assembly honors one of the men who discovered Boise's Bay. Coming up in 25 minutes, we'll talk to Al Chislett's son about his father's legacy and contributions to this province. Toronto police have charged accused serial killer Bruce MacArthur with an eighth count of first degree murder. He made a short court appearance by video link today. It happened after police were able to identify a man who was previously known as Joe Doe. We can now report that the remains have been identified as Kirushna Kumar Kanagaratnam. Mr. Kanagaratnam arrived in Canada in 2010 from Sri Lanka. This is the same man who appeared in a photo investigators released last month. His remains were found in a garden planter in northeast Toronto, and the remains of several other men were also found on that same property. Police say they're probing other cold cases that go as far back as 1975 for possible connections to Bruce MacArthur. The RCMP are investigating a fatal collision that happened Friday. An 83-year-old man died from injuries he sustained in a single vehicle collision on Route 211 near Grand La Pierre. RCMP say the man who was driving the vehicle was taken to hospital where he succumbed to injuries. The 82-year-old female passenger was treated and released. Two groups of snowmobilers got caught in poor weather on the northern peninsula over the weekend. Early Saturday evening, five people got stuck in a blizzard on their way to Harbour Deep. A search and rescue helicopter reached them about six hours later. At the same time, two other snowmobilers were stranded in the area. They spent the night in the woods, but they were okay when they were found early next morning. Repair crews have been busy this morning in southern and central Ontario after an ice storm swept through. Tens of thousands of people woke up with no electricity. High winds and falling tree branches brought down poles right across the south of the province. The mix of snow, freezing rain, ice pellets, then rain again and wind it made driving extremely treacherous. Some school districts canceled buses for today while others decided to close their schools completely. Well, let's uh, bring in Ryan now. And that's is that a not, segue or what? Yeah, <laughs> that's well, not coming our way, is it? It is. Oh, dear. The same system now uh, really bearing down on them, and that is, uh, you know, quite a storm. It won't be quite as severe here. It's going to be a quicker moving system for us. That said, special weather statements are in effect. And let's give you a little rundown. First, let's talk about the headlines. And we got to start with the sunshine for Tuesday. Don't forget the sunglasses tomorrow as you head out because it is going to be a really nice spring day out there. Temperatures near the seasonal mark. And then that system that we just saw that pounded southern Ontario will move in with an icy setup for Tuesday night and for your Wednesday morning commute. So you're going to, going to want to leave yourself some extra time for that. We'll talk about that coming up. And another messy mix for Friday. So really we have, as we look ahead, two systems 
on the way for this week. Have a look. Area of high pressure in control for tomorrow. That is our nice sunny day. And then Tuesday afternoon, already some clouds building in. The freezing rain really starting to creep in for Tuesday evening into the overnight with freezing rain on the go into Wednesday morning. And there is that commute that is expected to be on the icy side. We will change over to rain, but it's going to take some time. And we'll talk more about your timeline and your full weather forecast details coming up in just a few minutes. <laughs> Caitlin Osman impressing the crowd Saturday night when she took to home ice. The Olympic gold medalist and world champion performed at the same arena where her Olympic dream began. More than a thousand people crammed into the arena to see two performances from her. The next day, a parade through Marystown. Osmond greeted fans from the back of a convertible. Other people got aboard the floats for the trip through town. After, people lined up for her autograph, both young and old, but especially young figure skaters and hockey players looking to meet their idol. The Clarenville Caribous took home the Herder Trophy this weekend and made history in this province. The Caribous beat the St. John's Caps 6-1 on Saturday night. The team also broke a record. The Caribous have the first woman coach for senior men's hockey in this province. Rebecca Russell took on the job back in 2016 and she's no stranger to hockey. We profiled Russell and her hockey career back in 1998 when she was 15 years old and on the way to a hockey scholarship at St. Lawrence University in New York. Who judges the judges and who pays the bill? Why taxpayers are on the hook for a judge's legal bills. That CBC Investigate story is coming up next. And remember, you can watch here and now while you're on the go. We're broadcasting live on YouTube and you can also catch past episodes on demand. Just go to YouTube and subscribe to CBCNL. We're back right after this break.
Tonight on CBC Investigates, we have a story about a complaint against a provincial court judge, and it's one that's costing you as a taxpayer hundreds of thousands of dollars. The complaint was filed four years ago, but there's still no hearing scheduled to deal with it, and the legal fees are really piling up. Let's break down some of the numbers for you. The total amount of legal fees billed so far is nearly $624,000. And the bulk of that money has been charged by the lawyer for Judge John Joy more than half a million dollars. So, why are these costs climbing? And what's going on with the complaint? Well, to get those details, our investigative reporter Rob Antle spoke with Debbie. So Rob, take us back to 2014. What happened then and who was involved? So the central figure in this is Judge John Joy. He served over a decade on the bench in Happy Valley Goose Bay as a provincial court judge. He retired last summer. Uh, he was known to be outspoken. Four years ago, he wrote a critical letter about systemic issues in the justice system and sent it to a bunch of people in the legal community. Now, at the time, Donovan Malloy was the director of public prosecutions. He took exception to what was in that letter and filed a formal complaint. Also, the Legal Aid Commission filed a complaint around the same time against Judge Joy as well. So why has it taken so long for this complaint to be heard? Sure, so there is a process. The first stage of this is a screening process. There's a committee that looks at complaints like this one to make sure they should proceed. That did happen in this case, but it took the better part of a couple of years for that to happen. So there's now a tribunal in place for the hearing stage, which actually hears the complaint and makes a decision. But since then, Judge Joy's lawyer has filed a bunch of procedural motions. Some of those have ended up at Supreme Court. They ended up getting bounced back to the tribunal. Uh, so basically, there's still no date yet for this hearing to be held. Um, still a couple of things to sort out in the meantime. So this has actually been going on so long now that the two key players in all this actually aren't in those jobs anymore. Judge Joy retired as a full-time judge last year. And Donovan Malloy hasn't been a prosecutor since 2016 when he was appointed Information and Privacy Commissioner. So Rob, in the meantime, the bills are piling up. They're piling up, the tab keeps going, and uh, the meter is still running, so to speak. And that will continue until this hearing is held and all the way through the end of that process. Okay, thanks so much, Rob. Thank you. Now, there's a lot of nuance with this story. For more details and to make your blood boil even more, check out Rob's story on our website. That's at cbc.ca slash nl. Well, she's been in the legislature for about seven years, but today was Jerry Rogers first as the leader of the NDP. The leader of the third party. And the job situation has gotten worse under his government. I asked the Premier, does he not realize what our people are facing and what is he going to do about it? The Honourable the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and first of all, let me begin by welcoming the leader of the third party to her new, uh, to her new role, yeah, yeah. and we look forward to working with her. Thank you. This first day on the job, the PCs are about to get a new leader as well. That happens at the end of the month. Leaders from 53 countries, including Justin Trudeau, will be in London this week for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Today, Prince Harry delivered his first speech as Commonwealth Youth Ambassador. In my new role, I will work to support the Queen, my father, the Prince of Wales, and my brother, William, all of whom know that young people are the answer to the challenges of today. I am also incredibly grateful that the woman that I am about to marry, Meghan, will be joining me in this work, of which she too is hugely excited to take part in. <laughs> The 33-year-old prince was officially appointed to the position today by his grandmother. This will likely be the Queen's last attendance at the summit. The week-long talks are expected to cover everything from trade and Brexit to human rights. Rampage is tearing up the box office, the Newfoundland Connection. That's coming up next.
Welcome back, everyone. And uh, we enjoyed a sunny day here. Mm -hmm. And you said earlier, more sunshine tomorrow? That's right. One more day, uh, but enjoy it. Because <laughs> after that, uh, system Wednesday lingering into Thursday, and then another system Friday into Saturday. So going to turn unsettled again. And really, any time you can look out the window this time of year and see that big blazing ball of fire is, uh, is a good day. Uh, especially in this neck of the woods. Uh, minus two is the temperature right now in St. Anthony. This is a, uh, a webcam shot right now at the airport there. Winds in from the west around 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. And there's a look at current temperatures right across the board. We're riding that freezing mark for most of us. A little bit warmer for inland areas. And that is the name of the game as we march through the next couple of months of spring. Of course, inland areas just a little bit warmer. Temperatures near three degrees for uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay right now, as well as Badger. But oh yeah, after tomorrow, we've got this to deal with. And in fact, tomorrow night is when things will really ramp up in terms of those winds. Wind warning in effect for the West Coast, including Rec House, and a special weather statement in effect for Newfoundland. And it is all thanks to this system, which you can see looming right now. But this area of high pressure, it's going to hang on uh, pretty nicely over the next 24 hours, but the clouds will start to build in uh, through the overnight, in fact, in the southwest, and then will push, push, push in from southwest to northeast uh, through the day tomorrow, and then this entire mess that Ontario, Quebec, and now the Maritimes starting to deal with is going to be pushing in for us. Here is how things are going to play out in terms of your timeline. Those winds, which still have been a little on the breezy side for the northeast coast today, will continue to slacken tonight. By the time we get to 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, we're talking about some winds in the 30 to 40 kilometer per hour range will be those gusts, so not too, too bad. Temperatures starting near minus 5, minus double digits for inland and low-lying areas uh, for the Avalon, especially central Newfoundland, and minus double digits to start the day in Labrador as well. The clouds, again, will eventually build in through the afternoon tomorrow. It's an increasing clouds type of day. I think uh, sunny for a good chunk of the day, though, from the Avalon, the north coast through central, up into Labrador, and there's that snow on the doorstep by tomorrow afternoon, Labrador City, and that messy mix pushing in tomorrow evening to Stephenville, Burgio, Port Basque in that southwest corner. So it's increasing clouds from southwest to northeast. Temperatures again in that two to five degree range for most of us tomorrow into Labrador. Again, increasing clouds along the coast and that snow starting to push in for you folks in Labrador City. Winds in from the northeast. Let's time this out for you for Tuesday evening in through the overnight. The color in pink. This is our best chance of seeing the freezing rain and that does work in through Tuesday evening into the overnight Wednesday morning freezing rain for the Avalon uh, St. John central parts of Newfoundland. We are talking about the potential here of three to six hours of freezing rain by the looks of things. The north coast likely at, at the biggest risk of that freezing rain hanging on a little bit longer from the Bonavista Peninsula across to the Bay of Exploits, the Green Bay White Bay area up into the northern peninsula. Eventually that warmer air will push in and then will change over to just some shower and drizzle activity. But a good portion of Wednesday morning at least looks like it's going to be an icy one. So sunglasses for tomorrow scrapers for Wednesday and we'll talk about what the rest of the week holds in just a few minutes. Debbie. Thanks Ryan. The provincial government is hoping that an infusion of cash will lead to an infusion of coding skills in schools in this province. It announced about $700,000 in investments today in a classroom that's already high tech. Here now's Garrett Barry explains. At Elizabeth Park Elementary School, students are making watches, robots and interactive stories. We've started coding and we started putting blocks together on uh, micro bit. And when you download it, all the steps that you've coded onto the computer comes out on the micro bit. Pretty much what the story is, is the dinosaur is trying to eat the super cat, but then the cat uses his magic wand to turn the dinosaur into a little yellow go-go dude. Provincial officials want to put these projects into high gear. We were playing a little game back there with one of the robots and the, the girls who were, grade five girls who were showing me how it all operates, uh, gave the, uh, the robots a, a nitro boost and made it go very fast. And this announcement today is very much like a, a nitro boost um, to get this really moving in the province. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. It's sending more than $250,000 to Brilliant Labs, a Maritimes group that teaches tech skills and is now setting up shop 
in Newfoundland and Labrador. They'll teach the students, and they'll also teach the teachers. We'll start with just the idea of computational thinking, that critical analytical thinking skills that's needed to think from the perspective of a computer or a robot, that little step-by-step -step kind of stuff. We want our children and our youth to become traders and innovators um, and be able to uh, stay here in Newfoundland Labrador and participate in an active way. Their visits start this month. Government is also investing in professional development and specialized teaching units, hoping for more reactions like this. When this came into my life, it kind of changed my mind about stuff, so I think I might go half with this. Garrick Berry, CBC News, St. John's. Have you got a story for us? Get in touch. You can email us at herenow.nl at cbc.ca, send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at CBCNL. You like hanging out with animals more than people. Yeah, well, animals get me. Well, someone else who gets the rock, Dwayne Johnson, is Gander native and Hollywood director Brad Payton. Once again, the duo teamed up to produce Rampage, and that's this weekend's top grossing movie. It's made about $35 million in the United States and another $115 million overseas. Two years ago, Payton and Johnson had another blockbuster on their hands when San Andreas took home $54 million during its opening weekend in the U.S. Great for Brad, and that's a whole lot of millions. Yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of money. <laughs> All the way from Gander. Yeah. He's having a wonderful career. We should go and review those films. Yeah, really. I think we should. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> are rocks, and then there are rocks. The province recently lost one of the men who discovered Boise's Bay. Coming up, I'm going to speak to Brad Chislett about his father's legacy. Welcome back to Here and Now. In the House of Assembly today, tribute to one of the prospecting pioneers who discovered Voises Bay in 1993. Mining operations began in 2005 and approximately $15 billion of nickel, copper and cobalt have been recovered. Born in Islington, Trinity Bay, Al earned a diploma in business administration from Ryerson University and worked in accounting and construction before changing course and pursuing a career in prospecting. Mr. Chislett became the first person in the history of the province to receive a prospector's grant from government, 
a program that continues to this day. His company, Eagle Ridge International Limited, continues to prospect and develop projects in this province. Chislett succumbed to cancer a week ago. His discovery, along with fellow prospector Christopher Verbisky, is considered one of the most significant mineral finds in Canada in the last century. And one of the people in the House of Assembly's gallery today was Al Chislett's son, Bradley. And I met with him this afternoon at the Geo Centre in St. John's. Well, Brad Chislett, let me start off by offering uh, condolences to, on the loss of your father. Thank you. Uh, today, House of Assembly, they, uh, it was quite a nice statement from the Minister of Natural Resources. What did you think as you listened to her? Um, I was honoured and it uh, just kind of reminds me of uh, the impact my father has had on the uh, province and the industry. But uh, again, it, it was just really nice to uh, pay homage to him. When you think about the impact that your dad has had on this place, what, what stands out in your minds as, as, as people remember Al Chisley, your dad? Uh, well, you know, uh, he was very passionate about what he did. He loved the mining industry and he really loved the province and he always wanted to see it uh, prosper and, uh, you know, through his work and through his activities and, uh, you know, especially his family. He was a very family oriented man. And uh, one of the things that he always said to me, you know, throughout the years is that, you know, the biggest loss of this province was the out-migration of people, you know, and that those are the kind of things that I think about and his legacy, right? A lot of people focus on Voise Bay and the project, but, you know, I, I think about the man who just loved Newfoundland and everything it had to offer and the people and how, how much they had to offer. Mm -hmm. He did a convocation address at Memorial University in which he talked about how he was very concerned about the out-migration. Yeah. But I guess one of the important things about Voise's Bay, it provided so much employment, it actually kept people here. Yes. What yes. do you think the impact of Voise's Bay has been on this province? Well, you know, it uh, put us on the map when it came to the mining industry. Uh, you know, it also helped change the mining industry and how uh, new discoveries were, were developed. So, you know, before, usually large firms would come in and develop new discoveries and take over from, say, prospectors or junior mining companies, but they insisted on taking control and managing the project and having a Newfoundland team uh, develop it and maximizing the... Uh, the benefits for the province, and uh, they were quite successful in doing so. Yeah, and he managed to resist the, the offers from really big players around the world to try to try to hoist it away, right? Yes, yeah, there was, uh, when I say they, they struggled, they really had to fight to uh, get management, uh, a management contract in place. And I remember when he was going through all of that, uh, it was just, it was so intense. Mm -hmm himself and uh, Chris in the negotiations and we were on vacation I remember in Florida and he was on the phone all the time and we were always trying to like you know come with us and it was like no I have to I have to deal with this. Now your dad would go on to cash in for it was 180 million dollars or something like that. You knew your father before all this money. What was your dad like before the money and after the money? Uh, he never changed. You know dad grew up in uh, rural Newfoundland in Trinity Bay he grew up a simple life, but a hard life, and it shaped who he was. You know, uh, fishing with his father, hunting with his, with his relatives, and uh, moving away to find a living uh, in, on the mainland, eventually making his way to Toronto, and, but always wanting to come home. And mm -hmm. when he established himself, got his degree, came back home and tried to make his mark. And, uh, you know, when... All throughout his life, he always worked very hard. He was persistent, focused, and uh, but always quiet and humble. And uh, even after the discovery, he he never changed. He, you know, he would treat the the janitor the same as he would treat the uh, the CEO of a company. He always with respect. Right. Last question: What are you going to miss the most about your dad? <laughs> uh, my father was my best friend, and uh, I grew up uh, idolizing him as a child because he was such a self-reliant man but as an adult um, we got to know each other very personally working together as business partners you know going on a lot of adventures together exploring Labrador Newfoundland and traveling you know across the world and you know I'm just gonna miss his company and having those conversations uh, you know that we used to have it was a very nice tribute to his father. Mm -hmm. And what an incredible time it was when Boise's Bay was discovered. So it was big. huge. Yeah, it was one of the biggest in the world, right? Yeah. Not just in Canada. Yeah, yes. and uh, also Bradley mentioned there uh, Chris, and that was Al Chislett's partner. Yeah, the co-founder. Yeah. Co-founder, uh, Chris Verbisky. Yeah.
Getting pro tips from a pro, Caitlin Osman hits the ice with some up-and-coming figure skaters to teach them some of her gold-winning tricks. It's time now to celebrate one of our own local athletes. This is eight-year-old Cole Griffin from Cornerbrook. Cole plays in the rookie division in Cornerbrook Minor Baseball League. Cole is also a goalie for the Novice Royals hockey team. He won player of the game in his first game of a recent tournament here in St. John's. Great work, Cole. We salute you as today's Young Athlete of the Day. You were sort of looking at Cole and you're talking about baseball, I'm sort of looking at him, he's kind of a hard time playing baseball in that getup. He's wearing his <laughs> hockey gear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know what? Uh, they could almost play hockey in the streets in southern Ontario today. I had the pleasure, uh, if you've been in Ontario and you've listened to Toronto Radio, they have a radio sh show there called Here and Now. Oh, yes. And so we of often course. get yeah. the cross emails and cross mentions on Twitter. So they called me up today and said, we don't know how to handle this ice storm. What do we do? And I, I said, of course, ice storms are pretty frequent here. And we have short-term memories and just know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And their light is much closer than ours, typically, in the spring. True. Uh, but as we look at this map, I bring that up just because they have been getting some very miserable weather in Toronto and Southern Ontario. Uh, just three degrees right now. Uh, and, of course, uh, ice and rain and uh, Spring is uh, really uh, going to be, uh, obviously it was almost 20, it was more than 20 degrees in Pittsburgh a few days ago, just eight degrees now. So spring is doing its thing. We're seeing obviously lots of fluctuation of temperatures across North America, not so much in our neck of the woods, uh, we're, but we will see temperatures rise tomorrow as this area of high pressure uh, brings a little more in the way of sunshine, some spring-like temps, and then that messy mix that's been rolling through the Great Lakes, that's our next system moving in. It will be bringing some freezing rain with it for us. This is going to be the system that follows. It's moving on to the West Coast right now, and that's what I'm keeping an eye on for late this week. Uh, special weather statements are in effect uh, for Newfoundland and we have wind warnings in effect for the west coast of the island. Some gusts really ramping up through the uh, later tomorrow time frame, more so tomorrow evening into the overnight when we're going to be seeing some gusts in the 100 to 120 kilometer per hour range. And here is the timeline 
Again, high pressure holding on uh, pretty nicely tomorrow. The ice working its way up through New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Cape Breton, and then it arrives Tuesday afternoon in the southwest. Starts to spread in through Tuesday evening, and it's a Wednesday morning concern in terms of the drive to work and that potential for the icing from the Avalon across through Central to Cornerbrook. By the time we get to the afternoon, it looks like that warmer air will start to push it. That freezing rain may hold on a little bit longer in places like uh, the northern Avalon up towards the north coast especially, uh, but eventually everybody changes over to rain through the evening. The northern peninsula stays snow, and this will be another snow event for you folks in Labrador, and that lingers, that snow will linger right into Thursday. Some onshore flurries continue for the west coast, and a bit of a clear out for Thursday here across eastern parts of Newfoundland. The long-range outlook shows, yes, a brief break for Friday morning, and then the next system, again, just rolling onto the west coast of North America right now, tracks in. We have snow changing to rain again for the Avalon, the east. Uh, this could be a snow and a significant snow event for western parts of Newfoundland towards the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador. And that will linger into your Saturday as well. So any weekend plans for the west part of the island, you're going to want to keep a heads up on this one over the next few days. Area of high pressure will slide in as we roll into early next week. So uh, again, travel plans Wednesday and then Friday uh, and into Saturday. Definitely want to keep an eye on the forecast in the west. Temperatures kind of again riding that freezing mark, but a little more spring at the again end of the tunnel, which we always want to have some light at the end of the tunnel. And that does appear to be the Sunday Monday time period for both Newfoundland and Labrador. That's your forecast to now. Well, as we saw, it was a busy Saturday for Caitlin Osmond in Marystown, but yesterday morning she was on the ice in CBS for a coaching clinic. Some of the best skaters in the area were on the ice to learn from the Olympic medalist and world's best. It's a role Caitlin seems to relish, and these young skaters were soaking up every minute of it. It was pretty cool. We've been on the ice with her before, but it was different because she wasn't world champion then, but she is now. It's really cool. Like It's never happened before. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's not very often it gets to happen. And what was the best part about being here today? Um, probably, I don't got a favorite. I liked it all. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice because we don't usually get to meet people like this. We learn new techniques for jumps and we're trying new things, so it was always nice. It's definitely been a special day for sure. Uh, like Emily said, we've met Caitlin a few times now, but with her being the world champion and Olympic gold and bronze medalist, it's just a completely different feeling for sure. Jessica Goss was also at the clinic. Jessica was Caitlin's very first coach. She's originally from St. John's, but coached in Marystown. And for the past several years, she coaches in Edmonton at Caitlin's rink. She flew in for Saturday's big show. Why was it important for you to be in Marystown last night? It was important for me because, as you know, I was Caitlin's first coach. And when I found out that she was coming back home and there was a big welcoming for her in the parade and the ice show, I wanted to go home and remember the old times and think about her when she skated as a little girl and see all my old friends and former students and just feel the moment with her. What was Caitlin like as that little three-year-old that you began to coach? She was, uh, she was a lot of fun, actually. She <laughs> loved to skate, loved to skate. Um, every day she stepped on the ice, she'd smile, was happy, loved to learn new things. If there was music playing, you would always see Caitlin dancing or moving to the music. You ended up in Edmonton, which is where Caitlin has done so much of her training yeah. after she left Newfoundland. Tell me about how you uh, arrived in Edmonton. Well, I wasn't planning on coaching right away, and Caitlin's parents asked me to come to the rink to visit. Um, I went to the Ice Palace, and um, that's where I met Ravi. He was happened to be looking for a coach at the time, and he asked for a meeting. And the next thing I knew, I was coaching at the Ice Palace. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your coaching journey since you arrived in Edmonton. Since I've arrived in Edmonton, well, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I have. Um, Ravi's been a great mentor, and so have the other coaches at the Ice Palace. I teach six days a week, and yes, I work with some very talented young skaters. You have just returned from Italy, so you are getting international experience. Yes, yes. One of our students, Brian, Ravi teaches Brian, and I was asked to take Brian to the competition. 
and Brian won the silver medal for Canada. How would you describe how things have turned out for you? I love what I do. And I'm so grateful that I had a wonderful club to teach in Marystown, Newfoundland. They were fantastic. And I love my Ice Palace family in Edmonton. They're amazing. And when you look around, you watched a Caitlin skate last night. What was going through your mind? Wow. <laughs> and crying and more wow. And just, just to any skater, I'm thinking to myself, if you work hard, you can do it. You can be the best in the world. You never get tired of watching our skate. Know. What a great weekend in Marystown. No one's gonna, nobody it, down there is going to forget no, this weekend. It was, was, uh, it was really a wonderful time and people were so buoyed. And to actually, everybody, of course, watches Caitlin mm -hmm. on television, but to be so close and hear the sounds, and it was, was, it was wonderful. Great. Well, turning now to other news, the stakes are high for the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight. They're hosting their first home game of the playoffs. And if you're thinking of jumping on the band bandwagon with season tickets for next year, be prepared to face tough competition. CBC and the Toronto Star have uncovered a new twist in their investigation into the world of ticket scalping. The owners of the Maple Leafs and the Raptors have found thousands of season tickets controlled and resold by scalpers. But instead of pushing resellers out, the team's owners are doing just the opposite. Dave Seglins has the details. With playoff fever, fans are hungry for tickets, but they're also frustrated at the high prices and how few go on sale to the general public. Turns out the owners, Maple Leaf Sports, know that scalpers control large numbers of tickets. Not just for the Leafs, but one of their other pro teams too, the Raptors. Thousands of season tickets, and they know exactly which seats. But instead of cancelling them to get them back in the hands of fans, MLSE did something unexpected. They're trying to cash in. They sent these invoices to the scalpers, also known as brokers or commercial resellers. And they put them on notice that if they want to renew their seats for next year, they'll have to pay a premium. For Leafs, regular price for a pair of season tickets in the Reds, pretty good seats, about $15,000. Commercial resellers, it's $20,000. The best seats in the house, Platinums. Regular season tickets cost $21,960. Scalper price, almost $29,000. A 30% hit for professional scalpers. You'd think this is good news for the fans, the Leafs and Raptors trying to price out the scalpers. But there is more to it. MLSE and these invoices actually invited the scalpers to join a trusted reseller program, which some of the brokers view as a threat. Very mafia. <laughs> Irv DeGiusto is the head of the Canadian Ticket Brokers Association that represents more than 20 major resellers. We're being targeted. They basically want a piece of our action, really what it comes down to. Maple Leaf Sports defends all this. They say they're just stripping scalpers of some of the discounts that they give to regular fans who buy an entire season's worth of tickets. Now, as for that trusted reseller program that they have with known scalpers, well, after some pushback and questions from CBC, they've decided to scrap it for now. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. All right, our weather picture of the day. <laughs> Not much of a secret, Ryan. No, no. <laughs> but beauty. I had to show it though, uh, <laughs> secret or not. Uh, what a picture, and we'll have a closer look at this one and a recap of your forecast after the break. The sunrise or sunset? Ah, there's a good one for you. Think about that after the break. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. Well, the drama wasn't all on the ice at last night's game between the Washington Capitals and Columbus Blue Jackets. During the pregame warm-up, the Capitals' Brett Connolly tried to get a puck to a little girl banging on the glass. <laughs> oh, but when Connolly tossed it over, the man in the stands handed it to a boy standing next to her. And then, so there she goes, hoping a second time, but the same result. The guy got the puck and gave it to another little boy. So let's see if the third time is a charm. <laughs> Up it went. And check out this girl's reaction. I got the puck, I got the puck, I got the puck, I got the puck. Oh, isn't very, that very sweet? Happy. This is darling. <laughs> Beautiful. That's what I love about <laughs> hockey. And you see there was one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think it was Phil Kessel actually threw his stick over and the her little girl broke down in tears. <laughs> was so happy. Love to see uh, pro athletes mm -hmm. reaching out like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, our weather picture again. No big surprise here in terms of the location. And of course, if uh, you know your sunrises and sunsets in your geography, you'll know that this is a sunset indeed at Western mm -hmm. Brook Gorge. And a beautiful shot there that Mike Jackson, I assume, took uh, via snowmobile to get up there and to a great location. Superb Fabulous. lighting. Fabulous. It never gets old looking no. at that. That and icebergs and anyway, a few yes. of our iconic spots in this province. Yep. Thanks again, Mike, for sending it in. And that is it for us. We appreciate you spending part of your evening with us. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Good night now.